everybody, it's Mike from here to watch. We're here today, uh, back on the air, and we have with us Messianic Rabbi Zev Karat. All the way from Israel, you're not supposed to have him as a regular guest, we're trying to have him on every other week. Zev, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, Mike. Always a blessing. <laughs> well, it's always a blessing to have you with us as well, Zev. Uh, we're going to talk about your story today, your journey from darkness into the light. I mean, it's an amazing journey. You were, you were raised to become a rabbi, and now you're a messianic rabbi preaching the gospel on the streets of Israel. Talk to me about that, Zev, and how your journey came about. Well, you know, I grew up in, a, in an Orthodox family, a family of rabbis. My father, great-grandfather, and ancestors were all rabbis. My, uh, my great-grandfather was a Dayan, which basically means a judge of a rabbi. You think about uh, Judas being paid 30 pieces of silver in the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 15. Think about those are like those were my family members uh, that were the judges of the rabbis. And my whole life, from the time I could remember, I was always told that I'm going to be a rabbi. I'll never forget the time I was in first grade, Mike, and the teacher asked everybody, what do you want to be when you get older? One person said a, a driver, another one said a doctor. I always said rabbi. I was, I was just brainwashed that I'm going to be a rabbi, and that's the way I grew up, thinking that I'm going to continue uh, the family tradition. Praise God, praise Yeshua, that he opened my eyes, and I can sit here today with you and, and proclaim his mighty name, that he broke up that, uh, that generational curse. But I, I grew up, my father was uh, a rabbi that uh, had two positions. He had one position in Israel and another position in, in America and California. That's where I picked up my, uh, my English from. But, uh, and we used to travel twice a year to the United States and, and twice a year or three times a year to Israel. So I was half here, half there. And uh, I, I used to go to rabbinic school, so it wasn't a problem. And I remember my, my father, he was also the principal of the school and also the head rabbi. And I was a student in that school till junior high. And I can tell you that everybody thought I have some kind of a special privilege. But on the contrary, my father wanted to make me as the example. So I had a very, very difficult time uh, being in that school. Eventually what happened, my father uh, passed away. And by his request was buried in a rabbinic cemetery in, in uh, Bnei Brak, Israel. Bnei Brak is located 15, 20 minutes from Tel Aviv. It's a very religious city. It's isolated, that's where I grew up from, that's where my grandfather was from. And my grandfather, Rabbi Pinchas Porat, became like a father to me. And I remember I was, I wanted to go to the Israeli army. And my grandfather said, you're not going to the army. And you have to ask the question, in Israel, you have to go to the army. If you're healthy at age 18, 19, you're required to go to the Israeli army. But one thing I wanna uh, bring out for the viewers that in Israel, the Sanhedrin are over the rab are over the government. Nothing's changed in 2,000 years. They have the last call. And I remember just begging my grandfather to go, and he said, you know what, if you want to go to the Israeli army, I will organize you to get drafted to the army, but you have to continue to study uh, your rabbinic studies and become an authorized Sanhedrin rabbi in Israel. I remember that uh, I got released from the army twice a week, uh, I graduated from rabbinic school in Ponovich, uh rabbinic school in Nebrak after two years, received an authorized certificate that I'm an authorized rabbi, and after three years got, uh, you know, finished the Israeli army. I shaved off my beard, I took off my black orthodox clothes, and I started drifting away from being a orthodox Jew. My grandfather wasn't with me 24 hours a day, so I... I used to go to his house. I used to take off my yarmulke, which is, a, you know, the head covering. And as soon as uh, I left his house, I took off the yarmulke. And slowly, slowly, I started to drift away from being an Orthodox Jew. I certainly didn't want to be a rabbi because from the time I was very small, Mike, I was always told that I have a special relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaacs, and Jacob. But I never felt that relationship, Mike. All I felt was bondage. And religion what you can eat what you can wear how you can dress and I didn't want it I was just forced into into doing it and I would say I had an outburst of sin after the army I started to 
everything I wasn't allowed to do as an Orthodox Jew, I began to do. I began drinking. I began going to pubs. I began getting drunk. I remember that uh, one time I got so drunk in a pub, I got in so many, into so many fights, the police came over. I remember I beat up the police. And the police took me to the, to the judge, and the judge asked me, he looks at me and he says, do you regret what you did? And I looked at the judge and I said, take off my handcuffs and I'll beat you up too. And I, I, believe, I believe, Mike, I didn't go to jail for four years in Israel for two reasons. Number one, the grandson of a Sanhedrin um, rabbi didn't need to be all over the newspaper. And number two, Gad had a calling on my life. So I know that my grandfather called the chief policeman of Israel and he said, get my grandson out of jail. And somehow he cleaned up the mess and uh, I, was, I was set free. I then uh, obtained a, a job uh, working in an insurance company and then I went to work in a hotel as an extra job because I had a quest because I, I decided that the reason I'm not happy is because I don't have enough money. I need a bigger car. I need a bigger house. I need some diamonds and then I'll be happy. And in that quest for more money, when I went to work at, at, as an extra job in a hotel, one day a group from China walks into that hotel, Mike, with my wife, with my future wife, Lynn. And um, God was gonna use that situation. And I remember that my wife, Lynn, she stayed in Israel and the group went back to China. Now they came for a food exhibition. My wife was, uh, Lynn was totally from a Buddha background. She was a religious woman. I was an Orthodox Jew, ex-Orthodox Jew. And just this connection over here, you have to know it's something supernatural because a ex-Orthodox Jew that's a grandson of a Sanhedrin rabbi he doesn't marry a Gentile. It's impossible. So you have to know it's something from God. And I remember to make a long story short, we got married after 10 months. And, and she obtained an ID card, which is something supernatural because it's a long process in Israel, but the process went very fast for us. And uh, I, I wasn't happy. And I want to give you a picture of what our house was like in Israel at that time. On one corner of the house, we had rabbi pictures everywhere. Because, you know, although I was a secular Jew already, I wasn't Orthodox, I still had the culture. You have rabbi pictures, you want to do that the Shabbat meal and everything, it's in the culture. And, and Lynn, she had a Buddha doll, a big Buddha statue. And five times a day, she would bow down to that Buddha doll and light incense. I could tell you our house was spiritual darkness. And I remember that I had enough, I didn't want to hear anything about God. I wasn't happy, Mike. And I said, I know where I'm gonna find happiness. I'm going to the internet. And the internet was quite new at that time. And I was in a very, very sinful uh, uh, chat room in the internet. And right there in that chat room, a man from California by the name of Todd found out that I'm from Israel and he started to preach the gospel to me. And I can tell you, Mike, I told him, I said, look, I came here to run away from God. I don't want to hear anything about God. And I'm Jewish. I don't want to hear anything about the New Testament. New, New Testament, leave me alone. Well, God sent the right person because this man Todd could preach the gospel, Jesus, Yeshua from the Old Testament. You know, when God has a calling in your life, he'll find you wherever you, wherever you are. You can't run away from God. He'll find you on the internet. He'll find you in a bus. He'll find you in, a, in the post office. Adam and Eve tried to hide from God. You can't hide from God. God will find you wherever you are. And this man Todd was witnessing to me on the internet for four years, almost on a daily basis. And you have to ask yourself, if somebody is witnessing to you and you don't want to hear him, there's two things you need to do. It's called block and delete. And you know how many times, how many times I tried to do that, Mike? One time the computer screen just went out. Another time the light bulb went boom. You can't run away from God. And for four years, almost on a daily basis, this man was preaching the gospel to me. And after two years, something happened. God started to wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. I couldn't sleep. The Bible verses that he was speaking to me about were driving me up the wall. Isaiah 53, Micah 5.2, Jeremiah 23, and the enemy attacked me. 
If you people are praying for Israel, you want to know what to pray about, you pray about strong spiritual warfare. It is not easy for anybody, but especially for a Jew, to embrace Jesus, Yeshua, as the Messiah. He will be attacked. And the enemy told me, Zev, even if it is the Messiah, it's not the Jewish Messiah. It's the Gentile Messiah. And it was easy for me to buy the lie, but God wouldn't let me sleep. And I decided during the time that I'm listening to Todd on the internet to go and conduct an investigation in Israel. I interviewed 32 rabbis in Israel, 33 with my grandfather. I received 26 different answers for the same question. The question was Micha 5, Micah 5 2, a birth of a king in Bethlehem. And I remember going to my grandfather, uh, Mike. I, I went in there with the Old Testament. I never once mentioned the name Yeshua to him, not even once. All I did was ask him about Isaiah 53. And my grandfather got very nervous. Why was my grandfather getting nervous from an from a Old Testament? It was a red light for me. Something was wrong. And I finished the investigation, four years on the internet, 32 rabbis on my grandfather, and I still won't embrace Jesus, Yeshua, as the Messiah. And the Bible says that us Jewish people were stiff-necked. That's an understatement. And I could tell you that I didn't know what to do. I was lost. I was miserable. I decided to go and to meet the main rabbi of Israel, Harav Israel Lau, Rabbi Israel Lau. Today his son, David Lau, is the main rabbi of Israel. And you have to ask yourself, how can you get an appointment with the main rabbi of Israel? Well, he knew my family well. And in fact, he bar mitzvahed me. Rabbi Lau was the one who bar mitzvahed me. So it was very easy for me to get an appointment with him. So I walked into his office and he's so excited to see me. He wasn't so excited after my question, but he was happy to see me. How are you? And I said, Rabbi Lau, I have a simple question for you. I interviewed 20, 32 rabbis in Israel and my grandfather. I received 26 different answers for the same question. Isn't there one Bible? And the answer that Rabbi Lau gave me was this. Yes, shivim panim Torah, which means there are 70 different faces to the Bible. So the fact that you received 26 different answers is okay. You've got a long way to go. Mike, I knew right there that Yeshua was the Messiah. But I knew it in my mind. I wouldn't accept it in my heart. And the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31 to Jeremiah 31, chapter 31 to 34, that God will write the Torah, write the law on the hearts of man. It wasn't a knowledge issue. I was I said, no, I won't accept it. Because right there, when Rabbi Lao uh, answered me this, and I knew that Jesus is the Messiah, you need to understand how do, it was difficult for me. I, I I saw my whole life in front of me like a video. It was like what do you do? I mean, how do you accept that most of your life was a lie? What kind of a price am I going to pay if I believe in this Jesus and this Yeshua? No, I won't do it. But God had a call on my life, and you can't run away from God. You know, Zav, that, that is so amazing. I mean, it, it, I get chills uh, when I'm listening to this story. But you really, I mean, when you did this, so people can understand, you really had to put everything behind you, your entire upbringing, everything about, you left it all behind to come to Yeshua. Absolutely, and it's, it's a price. When you're in the flesh, when you don't have the Holy Spirit, and the enemy attacks you, and you think, okay, I'm going to pay this price, you don't want it. Of course, later on, you understand that it's nothing compared to what he paid, and you obtain eternal life. But I didn't understand it at that moment. I went home uh, totally in deny, not willing to accept Jesus. It was January. It was a cold winter night. Two nights later, 3 o'clock in the morning, Mike, I'll never forget it. God spoke to me. I was awake. He spoke to me from a cloud. It was a shiny cloud. Looking back now, I believe it was the cloud that hovered over Israel when they were in the wilderness, the Shekinah glory, the Shekinah. And God called my name two times in Hebrew. He said, Zev, Zev, Yeshayahu Nun Gimel, Zamashiach Shel Israel. Isaiah 53 is the Messiah of Israel. Mike, right there, I can't explain. I had electricity going through my body. I was shaking all over. It was the first time in my life, Mike, that I felt the presence of the God of Abraham, Isaacs, and Jacob. It was the first time in my life that I knew that I was a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. And Yeshua came and saved me, not because I'm Jewish, 
not because I'm special, but because I'm a sinful man by his grace and his love. And right there, I was born again. I had the, the, the fire of the Holy Spirit. They say a new believer has the fire. I don't know. I'm an old believer, and I still have the fire. Praise God. I hope that fire never dies off. And I remember my, I immediately, I woke up my wife, Lynn, and I said, Lynn, God spoke to me. I know who the Messiah is. And she said, go back to bed. It's the guy from the internet brainwashing you. <laughs> now, you know, it, it, <laughs> you know, Mike, it took me four years to embrace Jesus, Yeshua, as the Messiah. Lynn is Chinese. Praise God, she didn't need four years. I preached the gospel to her. And one week later, she accepted Jesus, Yeshua, as her personal savior. And immediately, Mike, I went, I took down all those rabbi pictures from the wall. We went, we took that big fat Buddha doll, and we smashed it in the name of Yeshua. And we cut off all generational curses. And the dark house in Israel became a house of the one new man, Ephesians 2.15. And uh, just, it was, it was just amazing. I have a menorah behind me, and it always reminds me of that Shekinah glory that we had. And I was, I was excited. I wanted to tell every Jew and every Arab, everybody, that Yeshua, Jesus is the Messiah. And who do you start with? You start with your own family. I called my mom up. I said, mom, I know who the Messiah is. And she said, who? I said, Yeshua, Jesus. You know, when my mom heard that name, she lost her mind. She said, Zev, your father is twisting and turning in the grave for what you have done. You are a backstabber. You are a traitor. And you know, she said something to me that until this day, it's just shocking that my own mother would say something like that. She said, a terrorist in Israel that blows up buses is better than you. Because he is not a traitor. You're a traitor. This is my own mom said this, and she just closed the phone. I then moved on to my grandfather, the head of the Sanhedrin in Israel, in Bnei Brak. I walked into my grandfather's house, and he's 86 years old. And I said, grandfather... Do you remember a few months ago I showed you in the Bible some Bible verses? And he said, yes. I said, I know who they are. He said, who? I said, Yeshua. When my grandfather heard the name of Yeshua, he wasn't my grandfather anymore. This 86-year-old man stood up. He had the power of a man 30. I'll never forget it. He had a glass window behind him, Mike. He opened the glass window. There was like China silverware there. And he started to throw plates at me. And he was just screaming, goy, goy, goy means gentile, gentile. And you know what? I, I couldn't move. And it wasn't the physical pain, Mike. It was a spiritual pain. And I can tell you that um, it was only after I just left his house. And only when I left the house did I realize that my whole shirt is full of blood, people told me. And I had to go to the hospital. I got sewed up. And I don't know if it's, you can see it here on the camera, but... I've got like a little scar here on my, on my forehead from one of the plates that hit me. I never saw my grandfather again, Mike. I had one opportunity to call him. And when I called him, this is what he said. He said, don't you ever call this family again. You are a traitor until you deny the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. And I told my grandfather, I will never deny the name of Yeshua. Now remember, I, 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 I have one sister in Israel. She's, um, She's eight years younger than me. She's Orthodox. And of course, the granddaughter of a, of a family of rabbis will marry a rabbi. So of course, her, her husband rabbi is a, is a rabbi as well. He makes mezuzot. Those are like the, uh, on, the, on the lintels of the doorpost. They have the blessing, the shema. So this is what he makes. Uh, the word of God is not kosher. It needs a rabbi to sign it. So this is what, uh, what he does. And I had one opportunity to speak to them. They had, they had seven kids at that time, Mike. And I went over to their house in Rehovot, and I, I shared Psalms 2. Psalms 2 is a very powerful messianic chapter. It deals with God and his Messiah, his anointed. It shows the deity that Yeshua is God. That says, kiss the son in Psalms 2, verse 12. And I remember I showed this to Rabbi Avi and my sister Sigal, and this is what, what he said. He said, Zev, you can't read the Bible like this. You need to read the Bible under rabbinic interpretations. He said, if you read the Bible like this, you will die. Not only will you die, you will mislead other Jews. You see, Jews usually read the Bible through rabbinic interpretations. And in a way, he was right. 
because in every lie there's a little bit of truth. If you read Psalms too, you will die, but you'll be you'll be born again through Yeshua HaMashiach. And I left her home. I never again saw my my seven nephews, never saw my sister. And in fact, if you go to Israel today and you contact my sister and you ask her where 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 is Zeb, where is your brother? She doesn't say that I'm a believer in Yeshua. She says that my brother died. He passed away. And I've never seen her again it's for years. I just pray for them, and that's it. In fact, they went to the rabbinic courts in Jerusalem to get a subpoena, to subpoena me to court so I can't get with 100 meters to their house. They were so scared that their children would hear about Jesus, about Yeshua, that they went and, and indicted me and the, wanted to get me a, an injunction against me in the, in the rabbinic courts. Well, I never went to the rabbinic courts. Uh, I wrote the rabbis back a letter. I said, I'm not coming unto, to your court because I'm not under your law. I'm under Yeshua's law. They would crucify me either way. I mean, uh, Jesus said, if they did it to me, they'll do it to you. And I remember I told you I worked for this very good job. I, I, had a, I was working for a, a, a medical company, an uh, insurance medical company. I managed 37 workers. I had five times more of the average salary. I had a new car every year. All my bills were paid for, you know, and it was, it was a, a dream job. And for the first two years of being a, a new believer in Jesus in Yeshua, every day at five o'clock, I would just go out and start preaching the gospel. And after two years of doing this, I get called in by the CEO of the company. And he says, Zeb, I've been hearing bad things about you. You've been sharing about this guy, Jesus. And I, and I told him, his name was Rafi. I said, Rafi, I don't share about Jesus and Yeshua at work. I share after work. And he says, I won't have it. And he says, and I said, are you asking me to deny the name of Yeshua? And he said, yes. And, you know, I'm not going to do it here, but he banged on the table and he said, you are fired. You are to go back to your office. You are to clear your desk. You are to return your car keys. You're not getting a salary. You're not getting compens compensation. And Mike, I was a new believer only two years. I was angry. I was bitter. And, you know, I went back and, and I wanted to... Uh, I wanted to, you know, revenge this guy, but God, God stopped me. And he said, vengeance is mine. You pray for him. And I, I just let it go. And everybody said that I was crazy. You should have sued him in the labor courts because what he did is not legal. And it wasn't legal. And I had a new obstacle now because I had to look for a new job. I don't have a resume. I don't have a salary. I don't have a pension. And how do you look for a new job without a resume? And so every place that I went to look for a new job, I wrote on my application that I was fired because I believe in Jesus, in Yeshua, and I'm qualified for this job, and I'm willing to work for six days for free, and if I'm not qualified, don't hire me. And everybody said, we'll call you, we'll call you, but no one ever called, Mike. And I went from one man power company to another man power company to another man power company, and eventually what happened, Lynn, she barely knew any, any Hebrew. At that time, she was working just a little bit as a cook. And most of my savings were stuck in that company. I had a lot of money there because the company saves the money for you. They've got like this, you know, uh, special saving account. And they're holding all my money. And the little money that I have was be, being eaten up during those 11 months. And I couldn't go to Social Security in Israel because under Israeli law, when you get fired from a job, you have to have a note from your employee. And if you don't have a note from your employer, you're not eligible to get any money from the government. So I couldn't get any money from the government. And um, God spoke to me after 11 months. And he's 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. A man who doesn't work shall not eat. And I understood that God is telling me, if I can't find a qualified job, then I need to find any job because every job is a blessing. And I went, Mike, and I found a job that no one needs a resume no one cares what you believe in. It was a very low paying job and a very physical job. Um, I went to work as a dishwasher. For managing 37 workers, Mike, I went to work as a dishwasher. And I don't know if you've experienced God's sense of humor, but God has a real sense of humor. And when I was in the Israeli army, especially when we go to reserves, I had an opportunity to exercise my hatred towards the Arabs. And I was stationed near Lebanon and we, you know, we did a lot of things uh, to the Arabs that I wasn't, I'm not proud of it, I'm not happy. And God was gonna teach me a lesson, not just to live the Bible, but uh, 
not just to work, not just to read the Bible, but to live the Bible. And my manager, when I went to work as a dishwasher, was an Arab. And he hated the Jewish people. Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies. And God was going to teach me what that means to love your enemies. And he finally has a Jew under his hand washing dishes. And he used to scream at me every day, Mike, faster, faster, faster. And, I, and God was just teaching me a lesson. And eventually what happened, uh, we were living in an apartment. Our lease in our apartment expired. And I had to go to my landowner. landowner and I never say landlord. I have one lord. So I say landowner. So I went to the landowner and I said, you know, I, I don't have the same job I have. I don't have the same co-signer as I have, but I want to stay here. And he said, no problem. You can stay. Give me a, and there was a lot more money at, at that time than it is now. You need to understand. Give me a $12,000 collateral de deposit and pay one year in advance and you can stay. Well, the truth of the matter is, Mike, we didn't have the money. And uh, I didn't have a car. Remember, it belonged to the company. And a very, very hard decision was made, Mike. I bought a very, very old beat-up car. I'm talking about a car that if you leave the car keys inside, Mike, no one wants it. And I took little belongings that we had and we put it in that old beat up car and I went and I bought, bought a big tent and Lynn and I went to live on the beach in Tel Aviv. And I, I could tell you, Mike, that um, when I arrived to the beach in Tel Aviv, the first thing Lynn asked me was, doesn't the Bible say God will bless us? Doesn't the Bible say God will take care of us? What kind of a blessing is this? And I remember what I answered Lynn. I said, Lynn, I don't know, but I do know one thing. God is not the author of evil, but God can allow it. I don't know when. I don't know how. But I do know that God is going to bless us. This is a test. And I can tell you, Mike, we ended up being on the beach for three and a half months. I can tell you when you don't know how long you'll be on the beach, three and a half months is like three years. And I want, to give, I want to give you a picture and the viewers a, a picture of what it's like living on the beach in Tel Aviv. Um, putting a tent every night, every morning at 5, 5.30 in the morning, wrapping up that tent, putting it in the car, taking cold showers. But we were, who's on the beach at 2 o'clock in the morning in Tel Aviv? Tel Aviv is a very secular city. Prostitutes, drug addicts, and thieves. So it was very, very difficult uh, for us. So I had to sleep three hours in Linwood Guard, the tent. And she used to sleep three hours, and I used to guard the tent. Morning time, I go wash dishes, finish the dishwashing job, continue to look for a new job because I was still looking for a better job, and just day after day after day. And after two months of doing this, Mike, I walk into my dishwasher job, and the Arab Ali is screaming. He is furious. Where is Zev? Where is Zev? And he comes and he attacks me. And he says, what is wrong with you? Are you not human? Don't you have a heart? Can't you see that I'm treating you like dirt? Why don't you respond? You see, he was trying to have a fight with me for months and he couldn't get a, and he couldn't get a fight and it was driving him crazy. And I said, do you want me to respond? And I can tell you, Mike, Ollie has long hair, okay? And he still has long hair today. And I'll never forget it, he just pulled his hair and he said, yes. And I responded, Mike. I gave him the gospel of Jesus, Yeshua. And praise God, a few days later, he accepted Jesus, Yeshua, as his personal Savior. And Ali is now in a Messian, in an Arabic congregation in Haifa, north of Israel. And his testimony is, a Jewish dishwasher preached the gospel to me. <laughs> wow. Well, Zeb, you know, we're gonna, what we're going to do, we're out of time today. We're going to bring you back next week for part two. Fascinating. Now I understand... I, I was always kind of curious why you were so interested in my testimony, and now I get it. <laughs> uh, You're an amazing testimony, praise God. It, it's it's amazing, and and uh, and and uh, your journey, and, and we're going to talk more about it next week, folks. A couple of things: if you want to see Zeb in person, you can see him in Israel, I'm sure. Uh, but you can also come to the Do the Watchman Conference, March 22nd through the 25th in Dallas, Texas. Just go to our website, hearthewatchmenmen.com. 
check it out. There's also on that website a button that says Israel Trip. Next October, the 70th anniversary of Israel, organizing a tour here at the Watchman and Paul Beckman Ministries. And you will actually get to hear Zev speak in Israel, and he can show you a few things around Israel. I mean, I can't imagine anything better. So uh, take your time, go look at it. It's a fascinating script. And, and Zev, I just want to thank you so much for, for joining us this morning. Well, thank you. And, you know, we give all the glory. It's really not not our testimony. It's it's all Jesus. We give him the glory. We You know, we're just small people with a big God. And I'm just grateful. Uh, to the Lord uh, for your ministry, for what you're doing, and just grateful that we can we can be together as brothers, uh, as the one new man. That's what it's all about. Amen, brother. Well, listen, we're going to see you next week uh, with part two, folks, of Zev's testimony, his journey to Christ, and what he is doing today uh, on a daily basis. God bless each and every one of you. And remember. You can do absolutely anything with Yeshua in your heart, except nothing at all. So get out there, get busy, answer the call. We'll see you next week here on The Watchman's Report.